Well, hello there. You've probably heard my voice before, but you've probably not heard voice of this guy next to me. Hello, I'm the guy with the voice you haven't heard yet. Yeah, and he's the guy who's actually writing the stuff you're hearing. And who's writing the comments and reading them. Which is a kind of tough responsibility to have around here. I mean, I, I didn't read the comments I write. I mean, I do read the comments I write. Okay, I'm talking Marvel movies. No. Yeah, well, whatever. And we are here to answer some of the questions we had f uh, about our Kurzgesagt video. And uh, only that, I believe. Yeah, and there were a lot of them, like like a lot, lot. Like, you probably know that we run a channel in Poland, which is fairly huge for Poland at 30,000 subs. So I underestimated how many comments are there in like 4,000 comments. So um, I gave up at some point and uh, we've decided that we're going to put all of this stuff together like um, in topical blocks and just read some points from the comments or like uh, some thoughts that it gave rise to. So basically we're gonna wing it and see how it goes. Yeah, mostly wing it. Like the intro is us winging it, but uh, s most of the responses to the comments we have like semi scripted because our, our English is good enough to communicate in basic ideas, but not, uh, well, at least mine isn't to communicate more complex ones. So they have been thought out uh, earlier. Yeah, uh, mine, English, mine, mine English is pretty good, yeah. Yeah. Yes, very, very, um, yes, very, very. Yeah, so my English is better, but on the other hand, like, I'm much better at writing than I'm at speaking. So that's probably the ADHD talking. Um, so if you're wondering, like, why our videos are that good, it's because they are written out beforehand and it takes a long, long time to do that. So this is why the, a lot of this stuff is, um, as Pan N said, semi-scripted. Actually, we haven't introduced ourselves. True. It's like, what, three minutes into recording and we we don't even know. You don't even know who you're, to who you're listening to. So I am Pan N, or Mr. N, uh, Mr. N uh, coming from uh, Narrator, uh, also Narrator in Polish. So it's basically the same. And next to me is uh, Mr. S, or Pan S, as the script writer. So we are the duo that makes all those uh, funny movies. And more about us you can hear in the other upcoming Q&A, which, which is was supposed to be 50,000 Q&A, but now it's going to be 20,000 Q&A because we get 5,000 subs more. Okay, for whatever reasons, some algorithmic bump. Um, and here we're just going to focus on the Kurzgesagt things. Yeah, so let's get down to it. Right. Uh, like we have a lot of questions that were basically uh, repeating it themselves in various forms. So we kind of uh, took the gist of them and we'll try to answer them in more broader terms. Okay, so let's yeah. go with the first one. Yeah. We are political as well, but leftists. So, uh, well, yeah, yes, we are. And well, it's not like we were trying to hide it. But honestly, does anyone expect a warning at the start of the video of incoming leftist propaganda? I'd say that would instantly make many of you switch it off. Yeah, however, we probably could say something about that in the credits of the Kurzgesagt video. But <laughs> it got lost in translation and uh, our deadlines a little bit. So surprise, surprise. Yeah, and that kind of got lost in the translation, literally, because our Polish channel is explicitly leftist uh, with an asterisk. I'm going to talk about it in a moment. Um, so we didn't have to say that, and probably it would make sense to say it in this video somehow, and perhaps mention how we understand the politics and the political. Well, that's an idea for perhaps another video. The, the problem was like we tried to f more or less make a direct translation and we forgot that, hey, my, oh my god, like they didn't know about us and uh, maybe we should have had said something. Okay, that said, 
uh, what Panen said about the uh, warning at the beginning of the video. Like some people got really upset for the strangest things. Like for example, when we mentioned Frankfurt School, there were some comments going like, oh my God, at this point I knew this was a Marxist drivel. And like, the uh, idea of instrumental reason, that's something very uncontroversial uh, in uh, Frankfurt School. It's not something leftist that much. And that was a bit of a surprise, but it shows their bias. Okay, but um, anyway, uh, I said there is an asterisk. Um, the goal of our channel is to educate, uh, basically. It's mostly a philo philosophical channel. Uh, so we're not much into like old theories, like the bearded guys from 19th century, like, sorry. Because that's been explained well enough. Um, does it apply still? Like, there's a lot of discussion. Some of it does, some of it doesn't. Uh, again, it's been covered somewhere else. We're not into stuff that goes against academia in general, like uh, some ideas, some sectarian ideas of Marxism, for example. That doesn't mean we're not practical. Like, uh, when, especially when it comes to the climate movement and the philosophy uh, around it, there's a huge focus on practice, or on praxis, you can say, on creating movements and changing the world. Uh, and that's also something that modern uh, contemporary philosophy and social sciences focus on. It's like how everything is interconnected and you can't just like create theory and expect people to follow it. You have to understand the way social movements form, the way everything interacts together. Uh, so basically you have to be engaged in this science. Yeah, and by the way, our Polish channel name is uh, Myśleć Głębiej, which translates to to think deeper. And, you know, I think it's lovely, rolls up the tongue, uh, but also explains its goal well. Um, I mean, it rolls up the tongue in Polish. Like, for you, it was probably, well, anyway. But uh, I think it's in English also, like, to think deeper. Like, it's easy to say. I, I don't have any trouble with it, at least. Yeah, I have but... trouble with more easier to say words than that. Yeah, yeah, whatever. Anyway, um, the goal of our videos aren't like easily digestible propaganda videos, but highly nutritious propaganda videos. Like digestibility depends, uh, but definitely you need to do your amount of chewing. So what we want to do is to take uh, some of the philosophical and sociological concepts and make them accessible for more people to use them, like in thinking, in their discussion, and so on. So these aren't necessarily like prepackaged talking points. So this is why we talk about stuff like solar punk, instrumental reason, eco-modernism, degrowth, and so on and so on. Like not just making a debunk, um, but in our opinion, having a debunk without some theory would be, I guess, boring. Okay. Yeah. And the big difference is our videos are straight up political. Well, Kurtz Gazakt pretends it's not, and then kind of like delves into politics. So this is the agenda bit. I mean, aside from the agenda bit being um, very good shit post quality. Oh, I, I can't say shit. Um, okay, next question then. I think that answers it, it well enough. So the next question, this next set of question is, what do you guys think of Kurtz Gazakt? And I think like, I'm the only person here who watched Kurt's Kazakh. You kind of didn't watch Kurt's Kazakh? I only watched those few episodes that were necessary to see in order to make our video. I haven't watched anything else of the Kurt's Kazakh. So they might be actually pretty good uh, science popularizing channel, but uh, I didn't get to that content. I just watched those few videos about climate change. And as one commenter said, out of those few uh, videos, they seem like a good sellers of copium. Okay, so actually I watched some Kurt Kazakh videos some but time I'm, ago. But I might be wrong. I actually might be wrong on this. Just from those climate videos. So don't hate me, please. Yeah, so he's biased. <laughs> yeah, I got I got it on the wrong foot, so yeah. But that's the thing, like I'm biased as well, but I'm biased the other way around. I used to watch Kurt Gesagt a few years back, I think. 
um, it was really cool, like cool popular science stuff. And then uh, I, at some point I saw um, the good news video and I kind of watched in the background or like watched half of it. It's like, oh, okay, yeah, that's that's fair enough, fair enough. And I think it switched off just before, before the degrowth bit. Um, and then I think it was this uh, second vid I watched and something clicked. I watched it, I was like, hey, come on. And then I watched the good news vid and saw the degrowth bit. And that was the straw that broke the camel's back for me. It, it was still something I was looking into for the past few months at that point. And if I were to write that part now, I think it would sound way more aggressive. Because like what they said, I know it was just a sentence, but it was a typical smear campaign of, oh, look at the bad word, it is bad, so we should think bad things about it. Yeah, it, aside from that, it's a cool channel, like you said, if you like science stuff, so guys, don't hate them. I mean, yes, they have the problems, but these are the problems that we've mentioned. It's not like, okay, everyone's unsubscribe and whatever, send them hate mail. They're mainstream and they can only say mainstream stuff. And yeah, of course, uh, like with all of the mainstream stuff, eventually, historically, it's going to turn out horrible, some parts of it. Like look at the mainstream stuff about like LGBTQ folks or about the global south from like 50 years ago. But that's something normal. That's something that happens. That's the way of the world. And pointing out the problems with this is also something that's normal, that happens, that's the way of the world. Um, there is no particular evil in it. So no channel with this number of subs can be like based politically. Uh, because like, let's be clear, um, for us based and radical very often are similar things. Because, come on, abolishing slavery, women's suffrage, decolonization, uh, like most of the independent movements, they are based and they're obviously correct, but they are so radical. Like, it's not, oh, let's meet halfway, like, I, I don't know, whatever, let's just give the rich woman vote or whatever. This is the stuff that the mainstream is going to look back on and say, oh my God, how could these people of the past be so stupid? How could they not follow Martin Luther King? Yeah, but look, if you look at Black Lives Matter, oh, that's different. You know, that's that's totally not like Luther King. So let's discuss this. Like, no, there isn't any difference. Basically, like everyone agrees that you shouldn't kill people just because of their skin color. Yep. Um, so ethically, the answer is obvious. And that's the answer that will come to as collective humanity. And yes, I'm saying collective humanity unironically. We need more rights for more people. This has been the global trajectory since like the Enlightenment. Again, I'm saying it unironically. I doubt that's going to change. Like, when was the last time we collectively said, oh no, we were wrong, this group of people doesn't need human rights. Sure, that happens on a local level. Um, yeah, like guys in the US had, and like we had for the past few years. Some party decides that, oh, it's okay, now we're gonna hate on this nation or this religion or these refugees. And then you have a turmoil for a moment, but in the end it all moves in direction of more rights for more people. And with time we're starting to include also non-human beings. And I don't really see that changing. Bit of a tangent here, sorry. Uh, so back to Kurtz's act. There are some other videos that you have problems with, like overpopulation or geoengineering, and it might make sense to make an answer to those as well, but only if we can make it work. So again, insert some interesting theory in it, and not just, oh my god, the T3 again did some Kurtz Gazak hating video, like we gotta get these clicks. So like, no promises. Okay, and last thing about Kurt Gazakt. Um, I'd say there are like three types of videos that they make. Like one of them are the popular science, uh, one of them are the problematic political ones, and there's a third group which is like somewhere in between. 
like some people notified us oh that there's a new video that's very like long termist um like what happens if almost all humans ex go extinct and then uh, humanity survives and whatever i don't really have that much of a problem with that last group of these videos like i know some people are saying that it's laying groundwork for ecofascism or something and that's a valid argument something that's to be looked at uh, in the general media sphere, just something I don't personally feel like making. Uh, like for me, a channel like Kurtzke's Act, which often deals with absolutes like black holes, the death of the universe, the last human and so on, um, it should be free to deal with this kind of stuff and not treat, not have it treated as political. Um, this is my philosophical background speaking, like I like looking at logical boundaries. So the problem for me is, I think, when they try to take these logical boundaries and apply them to real world events. So like in their video on climate change, there was like, oh sure, a lot of people are going to die and that's going to be horrible, but whatever, we're going to thrive. Yeah, that's a bit of a problem. Okay, so next question that often popped out was uh, how can we be socialists as Poles? Well, you know, it's because of libertarian propaganda. They said I could be anyone, so I became a socialist and wanted liber 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 liberalism... <laughs> Damn, this word, liberalism gone, along with the self-help coaching gurus. But, you know, it could be worse. Uh, we could be fascists as Poles, and that happens a lot lately unfortunately. But that's the one thing that, you know, being now serious, that's the one, like, thing that makes me uh, dislike talking about labels and actually talking about points. Because people, especially in the America, have, like, this really biased look at socialism and communism. There was actually one good uh, commenter that basically said what socialism is as definition and how it was perceived over the years and as well as communism. It's, it's hard to argue your points when you define yourself at the beginning of a discussion as socialist or leftist or communist once someone else have a really much more different look at uh, that one label than what you're actually talking about. Yeah. That's me. Yeah, so the question is like, what kind of socialists are you? And my answer is simple, like I'm a Marxist Bidenist. Uh, but <laughs> yeah, but uh, honestly, like we're talking about degrowth. So if you see socialism here, then you can see that it's used as a slur. And there's a lot of stuff I could answer, but like maybe I'll start with a bit. Like, I don't know, like socialism ruined our country. Um, I really need to have like an American explain it to me because, okay, like we have university here in Poland, but it's free. So it's probably worth nothing. And yours is much more expensive. So, you know, it's probably better. Ah, uh, yeah. Like guys, we also have anti-communism here. Really? Like, uh, I, I think it's as bad as in the US. Like we also love Reagan here. Like maybe maybe not not in this room. This is like a Reagan love free zone. Yeah, we, not to be put, confused with Reagan free love zone, which is something completely different. Yeah, we, we'd put Reagan along with Thatcher in the group. You, you can't say this. I just did. <laughs> Again, I'm gonna pick that out. Okay, yeah, but that was before we created the channel. So that also popped up. Vision of solar punk, degrowth, uh, like whatever is uh, just unrealistic. And to that, we still argue that what Kurzgesagt uh, is basically about uh, propagating for? Uh, advocating for. Advocating for, thank you. Of not really changing anything is more unrealistic. But anyway, solar punk isn't meant to be a solution, but something to start up our political imagination again as it's been mostly dead for the last couple dozen years. But that's a topic for another time. Actually, this is what we want to cover in our podcast Solarpunk video. 
And if you want this video to come sooner, just please comment, come on Pavel, all caps. If you just comment, come on Pavel, then I promise like I'm going to copy all of these comments and send each and every one to his signal um, messages so that he gets annoyed and he does this stuff. Right, he didn't pay his dues to Daddy Musk, so he got kicked out of Twitter. Yeah, so uh, he's going to be our guest and talking specifically about this stuff, like what exactly Sorrowpunk is, what is its role, and we're also going to talk about this stuff and we're going to have some small disagreements and anyway. Uh, saying that, um, if there's anything we've learned in the 20th century, it's that politics doesn't follow like a set of laws. In philosophical terms, it means that it's more contingent than necessary. Uh, or as our favorite account ever, both the fifth column likes to say, no plan survives first contact. So when you have a theory, it's very important to confront it with reality and see what comes out. Because what comes out will decide on how you proceed to implement this theory and what you end up with. World is a dynamic system. The theory may try to understand and describe some parts of it, but then, Acting on it is something completely different. That was the problem with a lot of 19th century philosophy, like stuff taken from Hegel. Oh my God, now we know how the world works, so we just need to follow these laws and boom, like communism is the only answer eventually. Right, coming back from the break. How can we introduce solar punk or degrowth? Make a seven minute video. Yeah, uh, and you're gonna no. surely find all the answers you need in that seven minute video. Yeah, I saw that in the comments, like no one was like actually seeing problems with that, that it was very short and no one was taking it out of context. But we're going to talk about degrowth specifically in just a moment. Uh, the one thought I had was like for the people who went like Doomer or oh my God, like we can never have it. Like there was a book I read a few years ago I totally forgot what it was, so like, please remind me in the comments. And in the introduction, there was like, imagine a leftist at the very beginning of the 20th century. And you go to this leftist and you explain to him the history of how the century goes. Like you've got, first you got a war on a huge scale, then a huge depression, then you got fascism, then you got uh, more or less in that time a proletarian revolution, which devolves into authoritarianism. Whoops, last 10 subs here. And then bigger war with industrial genocide. Then you get cold war with basically threat of planetary annihilation, ecological collapse, collapse of social movement, neoliberal hegemony, and so on and so on. Like for them, it would look like a complete horror scenario. But we're still here. And the world is still better, I think, than 100 years ago. Sure, the politics are different, they're not as active, but I'd say still, um, well, we haven't achieved what we strived for, we achieved a lot of other things. And I imagine that the 21st century is going to be similar, but as individual people or as communities, I think we have more agency. Like, perhaps not to change the world as a whole, but um, about what can we do to ourselves? How can we protect ourselves? We've got more access to news. We've got more room for maneuver. We got more access to information, um, to techniques like even, I don't know, gardening techniques, um, how to make electronics and so on. Like, sure, it might mean that you need to leave your country. You need to change your way of life and definitely will have to relocalize a lot. But in the end, like, even if there's going to be some kind of civilization collapse, and mind you, like, collapse is a very, very, very broad spectrum. Even if in the worser parts of the spectrum, I don't think it might mean the collapse of your life or your family. So, like, no point at doomering. Or unless you'd go as a doomer, if you look a hundred and something years ago at the hypothetical leftists who has to face the 20th century yeah that's what what i'm actually like kind of hoping for 
is that the current system will be forced to tra to transform in a you know degrowth way based on growing social unrest and uh, strikes yeah right yeah hopefully it will not turn into uh, fascism you know that that all depends what social movement will be stronger at the time by all means i think that currently the growth has more popular uh, vote than uh, basically killing each other and getting into wars over resources yeah so that's my hope it will be peaceful transformation Okay, so, but more to that, we can actually cover some degrowth points, right? Yeah, so basically that's going to be a big part of this video, but we don't want to reveal all of our cards for the incoming long vid. But then you folks should get something at least. So we're not going to repeat that much uh, the stuff that's said in our degrowth in seven minutes. Yeah, like not, let's not t try to repeat again those 10 points of Solar Punk Manifesto. And again, I think that's a really awesome jumping off point to social changes that will be incoming, especially punting beef. Okay. Um, so there's an interesting comment uh, that happened very often and something we didn't address. That degrowth has an image problem as the word itself implies sacrificing of our quality of life having government take things away from us and or rolling back on progress depending on who you ask. Yeah, and that's the uh, thing we hear very often, something we didn't mention. The reason that the name degrowth stuck is twofold. First, um, as the commenter said, the name is unpleasant. But that actually works because uh, degrowth can't be in reincorporated into capitalist rhetoric, the way that sustainable has been taken over. Uh, or how solar punk might end up. Yeah, yeah, true. It's already like interesting setting for like movies to explore. Like, and that would lead to actually being capitalized on. <laughs> Recently had this like uh, sci-fi convention in Poland that also had a solar punk component. And the main point was that Polish people have discovered new and amazing OLED displays that can be used on products like to make uh, all the boxes and packaging shine because it's nice, it's cheap, and it can be thrown away easily. And that was like the you know main point of the convent. And that's probably not the worst greenwashing of solar punk we've heard of. But back to the growth. Uh, it can't be reused the way sustainable was. Like, for example, something is called sustainable because the emissions are negating by carbon offsets. And if you don't know what carbon offsets are, they are, most of them are big scams. It's like, for example, investing money in not cutting down the forest that wouldn't have been cut down anyway. Um, so yeah, that's greenwashing, but you can't really repackage degrowth the same way because it's too unpleasant. It challenges the capitalist ideas too much. And that's also the second answer and something that we see in the comment. Degrowth has to challenge the idea that growth in itself is beneficial. And this is actually a very modern invention. Like this way of thinking came to be only in the 1950s. Um, and the idea that the economy needs to grow and when it grows, we get more out of it. So the aim of degrowth is to break with this universal belief and to show that growth is just growth. It doesn't have to be good. You can also get cancerous growth or mold growth or pollution growth or traffic growth. You don't want your body to grow forever. You don't want population cities to grow forever. You don't want the economy to grow forever as well. The aim of degrowth as a word is to get us to discuss this unspoken assertion that more doesn't automatically mean better, that growth doesn't automatically mean progress. And what the growthers say is that our imaginations, our collective imagination has been colonized by the idea of growth. So we don't even stop to question it. We don't even think to question it. And by the way, like 90% of all degrowth criticism is based on this conflation between growth and good like degrowth word bad, so degrowth concept bad. Almost no hit pieces that are on degrowth mention any books or series. Or like, for example, these comments. The only question I could 
ask is like source who says that like really okay mm -hmm. can i vent my private stuff here well does it concern the answering to some curse gazakt points yeah go ahead why not yeah so basically um <clears throat> in doing research for this degrowth video uh, I found a podcast, which has like, I don't know, probably I was like the first fourth person viewing it, ju judging from the posts, Twitter and so on numbers. Um, and actually that was the first hit piece on degrowth where they actually mentioned degrowth literature. Like specifically, they mentioned Jason Hickel and two of his tweets. But anyways, that's the event. Yeah, actually shorter than I expected. Okay, what's next? What's next? Okay, so the next question comes and it's more specific in what is being asked here. Uh, so Crown Falcon 00 asks, the major problem I have with this video has everything to do with degrowth segment. Like the definition you provided is pretty much just word salad. What does the phrase even mean? What types of policy solutions would be proposed? And later he mentions that he's a socialist and I and he thinks that word degrowth is a terrible representation of actual solution. A better word message is sustainability. I can always count on fellow leftists to pick up academic words that have a precise meaning, degrowth, and use them as an abstract political philosophy with poor optics to the general public. Yeah, that was a good example of uh, w that was a good example of a well-meaning comment, um, which showed the problems that we've mentioned before. Just one thing that I would add is a definition is great. Like we actually saw that in the comments to our Polish degrowth video. And I was so upset that uh, it didn't go in our Polish degrowth video. But anyway, obviously like the mm, concrete solutions are out of the scope for like a seven minute video. And the bit about uh, fellow leftists picking up academic words. Like degrowth is the academic word and its definition is precisely like this political philosophy. The reason why sustainability doesn't work, we've already explained, like the sustainable jet fuel for Gates' private jet. Okay, and another question. Chilblain for how does the degrowth ideology aim to address global poverty? It's notable that poverty reduction basically always comes along with economic growth. Look at China's massive poverty reduction after instituting liberal market reforms that created high economic growth? This is an honest question, but this point is very often unfairly used to criticize degrowth. Like we said in our video, it's mostly aimed at the global north. Uh, I think it was Jason Hickel that said in some interview that um, this kind of criticism, like what about the global south? It's like if you suggested that dieting is good for obesity and then you hear angry voices like, oh my God, do you want to starve people? Like, don't you know that infants need food to survive? Like, he, this guy wants to kill infants. And they don't even notice that you're addressing a very specific problem and for a very specific group. Um, the comment also men mentions the industrialization and I don't think it's something that Degrowth suggests, but something that might come as a result. Like in the same way that some branches of the economy need to grow and other need to degrow, uh, some branches of industry need to grow and degrow as well. Like we don't need more single use plastics or more airliners, but we do need more prefabricated modular housing or energy efficient air travel, like I don't know, modern airships. So the point is, does the industry that helps the country to get on its feet doesn't actually destroy it on the other hand? Like, we could have industry that's also helping the climate. Of course, with some costs, but still that's better than just having, like, industry that outright destroys the climate, but hey, it provides growth. So, like, eventually it's going to help to fund the stuff that's going to help the climate. Again, J Hickel says in his book, like, guys, you want better solar panels? You invest in solar panels. You don't, like, invest in air travel hoping that this growth is going to get you better solar panels. Okay, this bit is about economics. Um, and it's not m that much of a question. It's just like an awesome comment. Right. So Hale says, 
Also, on a side note, what's bizarre is that people presume economics is centered around money, and yeah, it is, but putting the politics and the GDP growth as and capitalistic decreasing prices aside, economics, fundamentally, is the study of how we just manage limited stuff with unlimited wants. Economics is very interested in the well-being of society, collectively dealing with resources, i.e. research on those indigenous handling water, and etc. So it's a bit weird seeing economics being singled out to prices, GDP, and tech in fighting climate change when it includes discussions on the global south environmentally damning side effects for eco-progress, i.e. more dams and wind turbines and desalination plants, neuropsychology, i.e. limiting consumerism and more. Yeah, this is a very cool point uh, yeah. of what basically philosophy of economics deals with um, versus what we understand as economics like in the everyday life. The thing is the current mainstream economics is basically politics by their means. It's presented as this like science, almost like a natural science that studies some laws and describes the world in a way that physics does. But basically what it does, it, it preserves and justifies the status quo. Like, it's not a controversial position. And it's not a controversial position that we have a ton of different economics schools, uh, because basically economics is a social science. And this is something that proponents of economics in this way, I would say, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say tend to forget, but aim to forget. Because the idea is to present like, oh, look, here are the hard numbers. So that means, oh, we need to cut this thing and we can't afford to do that other thing. But yeah, economics has a deep, deep, deep philosophical underpinnings. And at the very base level, it's also about values, like, uh, but in an abstract sense, about what we value the most and how, according to these values, should we value things like monetarily and distribute them. Okay. So that was all about the economics part. Now, the questions about science and uh, all in all, uh, I, you, we, we're surprised at the relatively low number of comments that took our criticism of instrumental reason as criticism of science itself. Like, there were some, but still much less than we both expected. Yeah, like, that was that was nice, actually. Um, and it's also nice because that's not something I've really heard that much before I went into philosophy and like, much deeper into politics and theory, like concept of instrumental reason. Um, and here's a cool comment from Cosmic Cat Girl. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so she says, would you say that one problem in the focus on modern science alone coming up with a solution to climate change, as Kurzgesagt exact elaborate on, when that's just not truly possible without thousand times the resources and 100 times the time, which would cause more destruction before a technological solution is reached? Would you say a balance between modern science in a much less for-profit manner and other solutions like reduction in consumption and ideological philosophical change, i.e. the end of consumerism, are a good way to approach the existential threat of climate change? Um, the second part. So much. But um, the first part is um, interesting. Um, and what I want to mention about many of these good faith comments is that what we're doing here, we're not criticizing them, but they're just cool jumping off points. Like at this point, I guess the commenter used kind of like a shorthand uh, and this is makes it such a good starting point because it illustrates the point on our modern science beautifully. The words technological solution. Because it's not just about having the proper technology. It's not just about having some device like a climate repairinator. You push the button, poof, climate change is no more. No, technological solutions means having a technology that is workable. And workable means that it is workable within the current economic and political system. So you see in this way how technology and science in the end are subservient to capitalism. 
Um, like, do we have the technology that allows us for degrowth solution to climate change? Heck yeah. Well, but that's not a technological solution. Then, like, it's politics. So the politics here is like this unmentioned constant in the background, because it's only a technological solution when politics says that it is. So. For example, you have groups like Scientist Rebellion openly calling for degrowth. Like, uh, here's a part of their open letter. Or you have degrowth mentioned in the IPCC report, but that's not classified as science. By the way, if you look at it from the outside, uh, it's such a fascinating phenomenon. Like, in ancient Greece, you had the theoria, the uh, theoretical philosophy and praxis, practical philosophy. So, ethics and politics. And... Politics is basically just ethics done collectively. Like initially, the first of those was about understanding the world, and the second was about working out how to live accordingly to that understanding. So politics were like an interpretation of philosophy. But with time, um, with the triumph of so-called value-neutral science, the belief that science is value-neutral, these things became more and more divided. Um, Science tried to become more objective, more disinterested, and politics became more and more self-interested. So now that the climate crisis, we we can see just how absurd this division has become. Everyone's worshipping science and technology as this greatest human understanding of the world ever. But then you have scientists that say, oh, we need to change our way of life. Um, So basically, scientists have been warning us for the like 60 years, 60 some odd years, more or less. And over here is like, shut up, you know nothing. You're just here to make gadgets for us. Yeah, and um, if we're talking this way, then you can look at this comment and more specifically like this part. The Bobby Brown wrote, uh, finally, I think you misunderstand Kurzgesagt at 1 hour and 35. The asteroid billionaire who fired the scientists and engineers is different from this. Environmental scientists warning how dire the situation is, and Kurzgesagt acknowledges, is different to focusing on the scientists and engineers working on solutions, like the difference between a disease monitor and a doctor. One identifies the issue, the other works to solve it. Kurz is not ignoring and firing the scientists warning the situation is dire. Kurzgesagt's video is about technological progress and that is fine. Yours is about the deeper and more systemic changes that need to be made and that is fine too. I feel both yours and Empanada's video attribute far more malice and intent to Kurzgesagt when in reality you just have different ideologies and that is also fine. So first off, like agree to the last two points. Um, That was the whole point of the video. But uh, in the bit that the commenter mentioned, we were talking about geoengineering. I really dislike that term. It would make sense to make that video, wouldn't it? It really would. Look, look. Should we pause the recording and talk this over? It's just like me talking aloud. Like, look at all these poor people. Like in the global, not Poland, who don't have the Eva Binczyk and her book, like on the Anthropocene, which is like bloody perfect. If you work in a publishing house, you should like pressure some people to translate the book by Polish philosopher Eva Binczyk, which is like absolutely amazing. It talks about the rhetoric of the Anthropocene. I loved it. Like everyone I knew loved it. Like people in our climate group who studied economics loved it and they said it was nice and accessible. This answer is sponsored by Binchik Note, a personal blog of Eva Binchik. Yeah, but anyway, um, back to the topic. In that bit, we're talking about geoengineering and more specifically about stratospheric aerosol injection, like um, the seeding of, um, like creating an artificial layer in the upper atmosphere so we get more less sunlight and we can fight the climate change in the meantime. And how it's criticized by basically all scientists that who aren't working on it. And that's totally the scenario from Don't Look Up. Like you've got the main character who was an environmental scientist, air quotes, um, so he can alarm, alarm people. 
But then he talks about Isha Wells solutions not being correct. And suddenly he's fired because, oh, come on, that's not an environmental science question. That's an engineering question. Like, um, you've just did alarm us on the problem, but now let us work on the solution and you shut up and make gadgets for us. So, and the same as scientists saying that growth is a problem. No, shut up. That's an economic issue. It's not something for you. So basically it's economy, it's engineering, it's business that decides how much the scientists can say, like when are they scientists and when are they not? In this way, the Kurzgesagt are firing them, all the scientists that are speaking against this aerosol injection, uh, against the economic growth, firing them as, well, not scientists, not engineers. That's not your thing. Okay. Finally, speaking of science and technology, this is also a very cool comment. Komi Kon Karne, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Fertilizers and genetic modification, as with any ecological component, are great at increasing yields in the right scenario. Runoff and pest resistance, respectively, are only issues when it's cost effective to ignore the consequences. Irrationality of rationality. Therefore, food sovereignty is the overarching issue. When there's new agricultural tech, it doesn't go to the hunger-stricken nations, it goes to producing more humanitarian aid in the north. These could be elements of truly sustainable growth, as you said of the solar punk view, both hydroponics and soil reclamation can be applied as is deemed necessary within sustainability-oriented system. Those who come with wheat, millet, corn or milk, they are not helping us, those who really want to help us can give us plows, tractors, fertilizers, insecticide, watering cans, drills, dams. That is how we would define food aid. Thomas Sankara. Yeah, and I just love it and it's going to be useful for framing later on. So no comments here. Okay, so now, now we've done yes, now we've done science, we've done GMOs, we've done economics. And now we're going nuclear. We're going nuclear. nuclear. Okay, so first we got a um, lot of lot of good faith comments, like that's just a sample of those. But we got some of comments like this. I'm not gonna read them, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Uh, not even acknowledging them. No, acknowledging but not even giving them look. Yeah, they're just here for context because so nuclear is a complex issue. Like before, uh, I used to have a very simple thought that it's based, it's great, but that was a different time. That was a time that was it uh, like okay, th th this word won't come through my mouth. Like, can you help me here? Uh, yeah, sure, sure, sure. Uh, you braced and ready? You need anything to bite on? No, or? no, I'm good. You need me to hold you? Yeah. Hold, hold by, you down? By yeah. the pinky. By the pinky? Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah. He's, he's holding me by the pinky. Yeah, that's it. It. Tips touching, you know. His, his pinky is very nice and moist. Okay. When, it was a time a few years ago when I was an unironic... Yeah, yeah, yeah. An unironic Elon Musker. That's... Uh, Ah, oh, thank you. Right, right through the. Oh. Yeah, but I, I used to be like that. Of course, I knew very little about Elon Musk, but you don't need to know a lot about Elon Musk to like him, right? Yeah, I still remember our talks about self-driving semis and how awesome that would be. That is something I do not remember, but I believe it happened. But I do. Um, so anyway, yeah, I used to be like a Reddit type tech pro and... I even believed in the rapture of the nerds, you know, the singularity when we are going to upload to the cloud. Okay, everyone has passed, right? So at this point, I was like, nuclear good, GMOs good. And at this point regarding GMOs, like look at the previous comments. And now the more I'm researching it, I mean the nuclear bit, the more confused I get. Like uh, there are different layers to it. Basically, whoever says that nuclear is purely good or purely bad is pushing a political agenda. Well, that's fine. Politics is fine. But 
if you're saying that and you don't know what uh, agenda that is, maybe you should look into it. Um, being pro or anti-nuclear, again, is fine. As long as you have this particular vision of the world that you need to push. This is how we create our common world. Politics is fine. Political agendas are fine. As long as you say that they are like that. Like Kurt Kazak didn't. But I'm actually doing some research in the background for a possible nuclear video that's going to come probably before 2050 at this rate. And the problem is so complex. Like there are some, here are some thoughts. Don't chew me out on this too much. So nuclear functions on many levels. Like one level is the disinformation level with arguments that don't hold up well, especially in the face of climate crisis, especially anti-nuclear arguments. Let's take three. It's not dangerous. Like, since we only had two serious accidents in the almost 70 years that we had nuclear power, and even though the Chernobyl one was big, like, and um, as it's something that's quite important in our history, um, and often talked in classes about how politics sucks and uh, government control of uh, and government cover up sucks, um, is still have in Poland, uh, because for us it was like a real life disaster movie. By the way, the HBO series sucked in terms of historical accuracy. Still, with that, nuclear comes nowhere near the safety of other sources in historical record. Uh, second argument, waste. Uh, a lot of the waste is recyclable, and even if it wasn't, it's a relatively small amount that isn't much of a problem, especially it's something that we can deal with later on. Like, first we need to deal with the climate in the coming decades. Third, uh, that nuclear can't be built quickly enough to help us decarbonize by, say, 2050. That's true, but like we're still going to exist after 2050, and it's not like we're going to decarbonize and have absolutely no problems with energy whatsoever. We'll still need the grid, we'll still need to use the energy, we're still going to change it and adjust it. So the nuclear can help us after that. But said that. Nuclear is hardly a silver bullet. Like, I noticed that there are two general political leanings. Um, in the anti-nuclear crowd, you've got Greens, which are mostly liberal, like hippies, who are very much against it for probably not the best of reasons. Like, it's a natural or the above mentioned here. In the same group, you've also got a lot of anarchists, but that makes more sense. Like, if you're anti-state, then probably you don't want to have such huge infrastructure projects. Um, and yeah, I know that there are SMRs, like the small modular reactors, but that's another huge topic with pros and cons and a lot of research. And on the other hand, you've got the like pro-nuclear crowd, like the tech bros, the STEM lords, like the people who reject social sciences and a lot of the right wing as well. And for them, there are almost no problem, like nuclear is a silver bullet, and anyway, technology will solve it, bro, like don't worry, we'll get SMRs, breeders, foriums, like whatever, science will help us. Like, a friend of mine called this science of the gaps, and it's really funny, like, you know, God of the gaps, like, it's when you can't explain something, and you said that God did it, and they can't explain something, and they say, oh, science is going to solve it. I really like... Um, Again, Jason Hickel's take on the topic of hoping uh, that science, te technology will save us. It's like jumping off a cliff and hoping that someone is going to develop technology to safely catch us down there. But anyway, these folks uh, tend to reinforce the status quo because we don't need to change politics. Science is going to solve everything. And this is the next level of the nuclear debate, rhetorical level. Like, for Greens, nuclear is a tool of the planet-destroying lobbyists. For tech bros, politics doesn't matter, technology exists in a vacuum and is always beneficial. And for the right wing, which is the biggest problem, in my opinion, nuclear is a symbol of the status quo. Nuclear is the silver bullet. We don't need to change anything. Sure, the climate change exists, okay, whatever, but we don't need degrowth or nothing. We just need to have the stable nuclear. 
to run our green capitalism on. So that's the nice part. And the bad part is, well, since there's an option for nuclear, I guess we just need to block and sabotage everything else. I mean, nuclear is better than everything else. Oh, it seems that we can't have nuclear for whatever reason. Oh, the lovely, safe, cheap and stable nuclear. Well, I guess we need to stick to coal for now. Like, all those renewables are just some damn tree-hugger lobbies trying to scam us out of their money. You know, the melons? Not the melons. Yeah, the watermelons. They're green on the outside, but red on the inside. Uh, yeah, that's actual, yeah, that's actual quote from one of our politicians. This is actually a very old quote. I think it's like they, they do this from the seventies. Yeah, they do this old, so it checks out. Yeah, it's still alive. You know, that's a very long term. These watermelons. Yeah. So for these guys, the nuclear um, is kind of like an excuse. Um. This is more like personal. I don't know how true this is worldwide, but in Poland, a lot of the right wing supports nuclear, including the very, very right wing, like the guys dressing in black and wearing you know, flags and whatever. The alt right. The, 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 the right right, like. Not the alt right, the alt right right. No, I, I, please, like that's not alt right here. Uh, like, yeah. the, the national radical camp, like it sounds great. Oh, right. So yeah. Um, yeah. They might not really believe the climate crisis and so on, but they sure as hell hate these Germans and their windmills. And the only solution is our good Polish coal and even better, our good Polish nuclear. Then there's the level of historical alliances. Like that's why the Greens are anti-nuclear, because way back when it also means being against nuclear missiles. And they've gotten into this political niche, which was like, environmentalism plus anti-war movement and then it can be very difficult to get out of it politically like you've got your voter base you get your supporter supporter base do you say now to half of it no no you know piss off actually nuclear is good now you can't say piss off um and on the other hand you've got the right wing who got very much into denialism and that needs to back out of there somehow and now they find nuclear and they say like Oh, sure, like maybe the climate is a problem, but here's a solution. We don't need to think about it. You don't need to change anything. And then there's the history of politics and technology. Like, sure, breeder reactors are better, but they weren't being developed as much during the Cold War in the West because, guess what? They couldn't be used to make nuclear weapons. Back then, the connection between nuclear energy and nuclear weapons was still important, not anymore. And sure, there are breeder reactor programs in India and China, but the West won't easily cooperate with them for political reasons. Like, I'm pretty sure that there are some people, high-ranking people in suits, um, who say, okay, lovely, like China is going to um, omit one bit, that, that isn't a problem in China, but can be a problem with, I don't know, like uh, in the US, and then they're going to use to take off our power grid at some point. So um, they are not that eager to accept it. Like the cooperation is very limited. And then you've got another level of technology not being solution agnostic. So uh, like in the previous comments, GMOs could be used to give countries food sovereignty, but their very nature, especially in the current political climate, again, science being subservient to the political system, um, focuses on centralization. Same with nuclear. The amount of research, oversight and know-how required to build and operate nuclear makes it much more prone to centralization. This is why nuclear is rarely mentioned in solar punk. We don't really have good working intuitive models of how a decentralized nuclear in a story would work like. And authors don't just want to write like five pages introducing the specifics of their decentralized nuclear plant. And this is like 15% of what I can say right now. And my research is still far from over. So like the last bit, I would say, just be careful of the nuclear good, nuclear bad. The, the thingy. Okay, I guess I'm... Yeah, we, we can take another break now. Yeah. The nuclear good, nuclear bad, edgelordism. One day later...
So this is the second day of recording. We need to we needed to take a break uh, last time because our and uh, our energy reserves. Yeah, that's a good way of putting it. Our energy reserves got depleted, and we required uh, more minerals. Sorry. Uh, so yeah, we're going back with the recording, and yeah, what should we start with today? So we should start with stuff that we should have said before. Uh, uh, the beginning, a, yeah, yeah, yeah. If you could introduce the problem. When people are overly excited about uh, Michelet UMB and well, they expect the, this quality. Well, is that a problem? I think we have pretty amazing channel with amazing content in it. The thing is, not all of that content, that channel's content is of this quality. We have many videos without any vis any uh, pictures, without anything on the screen happening. So they are basically uh, podcast format. Also, sometimes it's even uh, they have even less work put into them. So you know, there's even there's stuff to look at, but not 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 really amazing. However, we had like few really good episodes that are basically untranslatable to English because they are targeted towards one of our uh, favorite punching bags. We even wrote a little song for him in one of the episodes and animated it. And I should play it about right now. Trzęsiemy lubciami jak Szymon o przyszłość białych facetów! Arriva! Right, coming back from that, it's untranslatable to English. We could translate the lyrics, but the context is lost in translation, absolutely. So just enjoy the visualization. Okay, aside, aside from this thing that just happened, which was like Pan N showing off his work, uh, what I wanted to say also is that in terms of quality, like script writing quality, yeah, you get the best of the best. And also like original stuff, like, okay, some of this stuff is maybe good, but it's been also covered by bigger channels. Like say Foucault, you get a lot of that just watching Philosophy Tube's old videos. Um, so th there's not much more that we can add. And But this stuff, this is like original. We haven't seen it anywhere else. And if I can say like humbly, Kurt's Gesagt, I think, this Kurzgesagt video is probably my best work or close to that. So yeah, if you look at the Myślec Głębiej channel and go like, oh my God, I wonder what they said there. That has to be so amazing. Like, it's not. It's just, like, you see something about dog whistles and you go, oh my God, that has to be amazing. It's not. It's just dog whistling explained to Polish people. Another thing, what I try to do is... Um, to make all the videos like fully listenable in the way that nothing that is crucial is shown on the screen. Like you can follow the video, uh, you're gonna miss a lot of gags, obviously. You're gonna miss some helpful content, but like you can just listen to it and not lose anything of substance. Like for example, we don't, um, we rarely put some text and don't read it out loud. No, we do that very rarely. Yeah, and it's not like something again like crucial. Uh, yeah. And another thing for Kurt Gesagt was um, if people asked us, did Kurt Gesagt watch our videos, and should they respond? Like, we don't know if they watched our videos. They respond. I mean, their CEO responded to Ban Banada's video, and he responded pretty badly. And I don't think they will respond because there's no good way for them to respond and like maintain their image uh, they ha would have to say like okay we're political and these guys are also political and their politics are different i'm pretty sure that's not how you run such a huge channel so yeah it does, doesn't make sense for them in the pr sense to answer to us true they can only lose on this yeah basically right that was that. Okay, uh, so the next part is going to be broadly about philosophy. And there's this comment. You probably like don't want to read the username here. Yeah, I, I can try. Please don't. So, 
Oki Web, Comp. Yeah, people love deconstructing things. It's fun and easy, but actually reconstructing it in another way and actually to the same level of detail that the original system has is way harder and not that fun. So people usually skip that part. The existing systems have a lot of critique precisely because it actually exists in reality instead of some utopian fantasy with which it has to compete with. Okay, and this is a great point. Um, great point which has two sides to it. Like one is that philosophy is amazing at deconstructing things and showing that stuff that we thought was necessary is in fact contingent. Um, but what's not so easy to notice is that the current thing is here because it works. Wait, let's make that clear. It doesn't mean that it's the only thing that could work. It means that it's here because it works in some capacity. It works not in a, uh, It works well enough not to implode. And that means that it went through a lot of fine tuning in order to well continue existing. So it's impossible to reconstruct something in theory. Like all of these general ideas uh, that look so well, they need a lot of asterisks uh, if they are to work. So it doesn't make sense to compare proposed systems uh, to existing systems because the proposed systems are going to look way, way better. But here's the other thing. The existing systems are so complex precisely because they exist in reality. And all these asterisks, they also have these asterisks, but they weren't there since the beginning. Many of them were created specifically because of some crisis in the system that almost broke down the system but system recovered itself but make, by making this asterisk, by making this correction. So when you expect that a proposed system is going to have as many answers in the same level of detail as an existing system has, it's also unfair. Because at this pre-implementation stage, that system we currently have also didn't have this answer. It was just as utopian and unrealistic. And that's something to keep in mind. What it means that this line of thinking can't be used to show that, oh, either the proposed systems are better or that um, the actually existing systems are better. What I'm saying this just uh, that we need to keep in mind when we think about systems, when we compare them. It's not an argument pro or against one or the other. Right, another comment comes from Jorge Gomez, it's not only that we don't respect nature, it also has to do with the fact that nature doesn't really care about us. The nature is everything that is unpredictable and dangerous to us. That is where the lack of respect from humanity comes from. We do what we do to nature to ensure that no one has to be afraid at night of being hunted by a hungry beast. Never again. That is the promise of progress. And this is the perfect example of the dualism that Andrewism talked about in his video and that we sometimes mention as well. Mm. Nature doesn't care about you. Okay, like go to Mars, see how that works out. Um, because see, this is like kind of a glass half full, half empty situation. Um, nature, Earth nature, can be seen as something that hunts us or something that sustains us. But nature isn't supposed to care about us. Like caring um, is a human idea. Caring is ethical. To nature, we are not special. Nature doesn't differentiate between us and other species. We're just part of it, part of the earth nature, that we've evolved together with this nature. So when we believe that we need to fight nature to survive and achieve progress, this is what brought us here, to this crisis. And now we have many people fearful of the climate catastrophe, which is something much, much more dangerous than being afraid of a hungry beast. And also we had those who were the victims of progress, like food insecure people in some regions of the global south, or even Americans who need to ration insulin for some reason. Uh, so... What it boils down to is that this dichotomy of good progress versus bad nature is a 19th century story. Like 
we can see that the good progress didn't exactly work out as intended and that bad nature wasn't just as bad as we expected. So this is just like the popular misunderstanding of Darwinism as this battlefield instead of spontaneous co-creation, coexistence. Um, so basically what we're trying to say is that in the 20th century and in the 21st century, things are way, way more, more complex than just these dualisms. So that's everything about uh, philosophy. Yeah, we're a philosophical channel, so we devoted like a whole two minutes to it or something. Next point will be about politics. So comment from Erlind1212, TLDR, protesting as a solution and putting all the blame on the government is stupid. We need to change ourselves and what we what we are willing to endure for a greener world. So the solution is to protest Yep. against what and for what goal? Country ranking based on GDP? Yep. To stop being a growth-based economy? Yep. To base our energy sources based on green energy, even if it is more expensive? Yep. And why protest? To make the government implement these things? Yep. The government is normally meant to serve the people, no? And here we go. Like, it's meant, but what does it mean? Like, uh, did Trump serve the people? Does our government currently serve the people? Or does the government basically serve, you know... Their sponsors. Yeah, more or less. Or, or bodies from the banking sector or whoever is paying their bills. Yeah, so basically, like, here's the thing. Like, uh, is should the answer, uh, should the government answer to you or to, well, the capitalism? Even if we can do little to change the world in individually by living perfectly green lives, we still get a bit big change by doing so, no? No. If everyone stopped eating meat tomorrow, the meat industry might try to put out propaganda about their products and have new greener products with meat, but ultimately, if there is no market, there will be no meat industry, no? No, and this is like a very interesting thing what happened here. It's actually something that's pretty common, you hear that. Um, oh, we, we as individuals could change so much. Uh, because looked at uh, the thing like if everyone did this but this is very much unfair because uh, what you've just done is you stopped talking about one person you made it into a collective action so um, the only difference between what you're saying and politics is that you skipped the politics and made it into magic so in your version people are organized using magic and then you conclude that if you just replace politics with magic, then a single person can do it. But no single person did that. It only worked because all of these people acted together in some kind of magical way. So your argument isn't that much for individual change, but it's about collective change. Um, so what you can do as a single person is to stop eating meat and perhaps try to convince other people. Like, go ahead, do, do it now. Because that's the limit of what you can do. The, you can't just invoke magic here and say, like, if everyone did this. Because the whole point of politics is to make everyone do one thing that we believe is good. Okay, please go ahead, because now it goes even further. Okay. To put all blame and responsibility on the government is to distance yourself from the government and your own part of the problem. If they implement the change and they lose the next election because you have to pay higher power prices or, or the price of meat skyrockets, then the fault is yours and your communities, no? No, like in what way is it my fault? I voted as much as I can with one vote. That's it, that's all I did. Am I responsible for the higher power prices? Like should I, I don't know, should I create a power plant if I can afford it? Like I know that, well, if I would be Bill Gates, then I guess I could just like offset my carbon emissions from my flights or divest from fossil fuels. But as an individual, I can't do anything about these huge systemic things. What can I do about the price of meat again? Like a um, very good example and something that again Hickel quotes in his book, the reason this book is a classic, is like when you blame people for consumer choices, then you ignore everything else. 
Like you ignore the fact that the non-ecological stuff is cheaper because it's subsidized and the ecological stuff isn't subsidized, so it's not cheaper. So basically you get like bad stuff that is cheap and you get good stuff that is expensive because of government policies. And then you blame people that, oh no, they choose the cheap stuff. Why should they do that? Like maybe that should be the government's job to actually nudge people, nudge prices in the right direction. Example, because I did this bit of research just before uh, recording this video. I went to a local supermarket, which is like the supermarket. If you're Polish, then you know what kind of supermarket that is. It exists everywhere. Um, it's owned by Portugal. So here you got for colonialism. And it's not good, but whatever, it's cheap. And I think the cheapest meal, milk alternative that they have is almond milk at something like a euro, more or less. And the regular milk costs around 70, 75 cents. And I'm not talking about the good alternatives, like whatever almond or something that's like just oat or soy stuff. That's like one euro, one ten. Um, the cheapest one, the better ones run you at around, I don't know, two euros, while regular milk of better quality runs you like one euro ten. So the question is, like, am I to blame here for these prices? For example, you have oat milk, right? Which is you know, something that grows in the fields and you just mix it and you get like oat milk out of that. And you've got cows which have to eat that food, process it and so on and so on and so on. And that ends up being cheaper. Sure, that's because of existing, existing industrial base and processes and so on and so on, but also subsidies. So basically, Again, we've got this thing that there's politics in place, but we don't notice these politics and we look at the consumers acting within these political options as something that is given natural. Uh, and we say that, oh, no, the decisions of the consum consumers are bad. That's not how it works. That's not how any of this works. Next one coming from uh, incoming Rolf Copter. At uh, 33 minutes, had my suspicions when the Frankfurt School got mentioned. But here it is, we're dealing with communist rhetoric. And later on, I mean, come on, climate justice, what part of existing on planet Earth was fair? All that we are left to do is use the energy stores we have access to and leapfrog to a solution where we clean up the mess we left behind, if we have to. Because if we don't, then our species will stagnate and slowly, brutally descend to the available energy level and forced carrying capacity for all humanity. It's not fair, it's just life. And I really love this point. Um, we, we left the beginning, so just, you know, we know who we're dealing with, which political option. But uh, this thing, like, it's not fair, it's just life. No, it's not, it's politics. Like... What the commenter is trying to do here is to try to say like our existence is a part of nature, so therefore there shouldn't be any ideas about justice. But without any ideas about justice, we don't have society, like at any scale, right? Obviously, the justice is the basic um, existence of society. Okay, so the idea about climate justice here is about the political dimension of the fight for climate. It's not about humanity's race for survival, because uh, the way the poster is trying to say it, because again, he's doing the humanity bit. Like, okay, it's great that as collective humanity, oh, we did some colonialism and so on and so on. But now as a collective humanity, we need to not bother with that because we need to survive. Uh, otherwise, like everyone is going to leave to live just as badly and that's not going to happen like i don't think that when the brutal descent will happen that the author is talking about i don't think that global north is going to leave live exactly the same way as global south does again there is going to be the winner and the loser so to speak and that's the problem with the collective understanding of humanity because like we can use it whenever it's convenient for us. 
So at this point, it's convenient to the person commenting, but uh, it wasn't convenient to say anything about colonialism or now about climate justice, because now it's again global humanities survival and global humanities burden that's going to be borne in the same way by everyone, which is not going to happen at all. Okay, yeah, but um, here's a good comment. Well, that's a chunky one. Yeah, and let's just... Uh, uh, we're going to leave it on screen because it's a bit long to read. Uh, at this point, it would make sense to read it, but we'll just read the important points. But everything makes sense here. Coming from Peter Smythe. I hope it's Smythe. Sorry if I messed up that. They managed not to wreck their ecosystems to the point of extinction. Uh, what? Indig indigenous people do currently often practice sustainable solutions, but a quick look at human prehistory suggests this is a consequence of ecocide committed by their less indigenous ancestors rather than a proactive solution. They managed to stop causing mass extinction, yes, but invariably because they destroyed it during their initial settlement wave or soon after and were left living with the results of the mess they made, and so were forced to adapt. And later on, in the last bit, actually. Yeah, th then there's a lot of examples, which are good examples. Yeah, and uh, at the end, he says, no, the ancestors of indigenous people did not avoid committing ecocide, especially back before they were indigenous, but instead invasive settlers. In the case of Eurasia, settlers of already inhabited land occupied by other humans. It was after they made their bed that they learned to sleep in it. They only learned to keep nature alive after they stopped acting like settlers and started to become indigenous. Not by choice, but because nature forced their hand. They didn't avoid causing extinction events. They caused them and then learned not to do it again. Yeah, and this is a very good explanation of point that we just kind of breezed through. Um, because it might have sound like, you know, this naval savage trope that, oh my God, they have some magical communion in nature, like maybe it's their indigenous genes or whatever, that they don't wreck their ecosystems. No, that's just something that they learned the hard way. That's something that helped them to develop proper practices. And in many cases, they didn't manage to learn it in time, and they died off. And in a way, that's the whole point of solar punk. It's not like uh, at, uh, we went solar punk because everything was so great, and now we're going to do solar punk. We're hopefully going to go solar punk, but we're thinking about going solar punk, especially because there's this crisis looming over us, and we need to learn quickly. So the big difference between these indigenous people and us is what we said in the Capitalocene video. For indigenous folks, those who survived and those who didn't survive, destroying the local ecosystems was a catastrophe and possibly a death sentence. While in global capitalism, we can simply move elsewhere to exploitation, wreck another ecosystem and make everything globally running more or less smoothly. Until. The planetary boundaries here are the hard global limits to doing that. And now we are faced with having to learn quickly or dying out. Right, so next part is about solutions. And comment coming from, uh, and I hope I got this right, Yiji Meyer. Yeah, this looks like it's uh, Czech and German. So like both of our neighbors that have actually good beer instead of whatever we have in Poland. Which is vodka. Yeah, whatever, like Polish beer. The whole video is a well-structured masterpiece that opened my eyes in many ways. I was curious about the possible actions one might take at 1 hour 44, and it was just protest and also protest, but most importantly, protest. What? I was expecting the solution to come from the ground up, i.e. starting an agroecological farm, making your family food sovereign, growing the sovereignty and sustainability to the larger community and the town maybe. What is helpful about more people protesting? This sounds laughably non-pragmatic to me and ruins the amazing video. It's like, I'm hungry. Okay, protest the hunger and it will go away. Okay, so basically right. why we said this was that we needed a conclusion and we didn't want to draw it like too much. 
But at this moment, the way we see it, uh, protesting actually creates the best uh, network. So it's in a way, it's the, uh, something that the commenter said coming from the ground up, but uh, coming from the ground up uh, can mean many different things and protesting can help you network with that. Like just running your own agroecological farm, that's not very likely for many people, but getting to know people who run these farms by creating some networks will. And food sovereignty, I don't think that works on the scale of one family. Like it can help you for a little while, probably, but unless you just want to eat like whatever wheat and potatoes, then you need a bigger area. And protesting um, also works. Like I'm hungry, protest and the hunger will go away. That's kind of how it works. Like otherwise uh, what you're saying is like if you're hungry because of structural reasons, then you should go ahead and grow your own food. Like at this point, again, it's government, it's all the institutions, it's the quote unquote system that's responsible for all the bad stuff that's happening. And while you can do little to help yourself, you should protest if you're hungry. Like if there is no food in stores, then yeah, that's the point. You should protest instead of, I don't know, go foraging for berries in the forest. This is the same thing, but on scale. And at the same time, it does help you network. And of course, that's personal opinion, but we think that this kind of networking at this moment still is the most widespread one, it's the most useful one, it's the one that you can find most connections. Of course, it's different if you're already, like, I don't know, um, if you already have some contacts with agroecological farmers or just kind of like farmers who are worried and so on. But we're talking about like a general solution, one size fits all, that would be protesting things. Okay, and here's just a shout out for a comment, like we don't have much to add. Self Mones Fall. Uh, everybody talks about cars versus public transportation, but nobody about electric scooters and bicycles. And yeah, that's a big thing. The electric scooters are so so. Like, I don't think they are that good, especially the you know, ones that trash our cities and whatever. But personal electric bikes, as far as I know, are an awesome solution. Like, they work amazingly well, they help you get everywhere faster, They you don't need to sweat that much. And uh, from what we've seen, they actually have a potential to change cities. Electric scooter, not an electric bicycle. Oh yeah, I'm talking about electric bicycles. The, the thing is, bicycle is much better than a scooter, still, sorry, like scooter is more portable, but it's got a lot of other problems. And bikes also have like an incredible range. I think like an average e-bike gets you something like 30 kilometers or something. Um, of course, you're pedaling, but just a little bit. And of course, like if you run out of batteries, then you can just pedal on your bike, whatever. And you don't have to carry this electric scooter for whatever, five kilometers or something. One hour later. And welcome back to two poles talking about stuff. We took a short break, yo. Yeah, we got hungry. Um, anyway, the two poles bit is going to be relevant in just a moment, but for now, um, we want to deal with one more comment that turned up to, uh, turned out to be a very interesting conversation. Heldring writes, planting trees won't help because they are part of the fast cycle, so they only bind the carbon as long as they are alive. When they decompose or burn, they release the CO2 right back. So if I plant 100 acres of trees, I'd be a fool because the forest will either burn or decompose and release 100 acres worth of CO2 right back as if nothing ever happened. Dear gods, how naive I've been, thinking that forests, uh, when left alone, would be able to maintain themselves. And I went to a discussion with this commenter here and basically what we ended up with um, was an interesting analogy. One thing that's interesting about forests uh, is that uh, when left alone is a big caveat because like you need to not let them burn or dry up because of climate change. But basically the analogy went like this. It's, it's a famous analogy basically where you have, uh, um, you have a bathtub and you're filling it up with CO2 and the drain is clogged. So like it's um, draining very slowly. And the thing is like, or it's not draining at all, 
And the thing is like, if we reduce our emissions like by half, then will we stop climate change? And the point is no, like the bathtub will overflow eventually. Just it's going to overflow, overflow a bit slower. And so the sink is the slow carbon cycle. And here the trees would be something like taking a bucket out of this bathtub and putting it somewhere else in your bathroom. It's not going to stop climate change. You still have to deal with the emissions. But what you've done is like you've created a buffer zone. And if you take a lot of buckets and you put them in your bathroom, then sure, your bathroom isn't flooded, but you have little room to maneuver. Like, for example, you're losing fertile soil. Um, and also there's the risk of you tipping the buckets over when you try to do something and you get your bathroom flooded even more. So that's the analogy for like burn these forests burning up. So that means this is a good example of how planting forests is not a solution. It's just a stopgap. And now two polls about stuff are going to talk about colonialism because we got a lot of comments about that. Well, then... Let's get right down to it, shall we? So I think the best way to start this off would be to uh, say that most of the comments uh, were trying to, I don't know, defend the position that poor countries being poor is not the blame of colonialism because that was then and this is now. And that's cool and all. However, they don't take into consideration that there was no hard reset on worldwide relations between nations and countries from like 1400s to now. They just evolved into different forms. They are just like less obvious now than they were back then. Another point that was often mentioned that uh, stronger countries were invading weaker ones because they were like more advanced technologically and more wealthy. Well, that's like kind of defending uh, argument about human nature and law of the strongest. Wait, 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 but let's do the comment However, that. Yeah, yeah, we're gonna say, we're gonna take the comment from that, but you could introduce new tech to other countries without forcing them into submission, but unfortunately that's what was and is still going on. Yeah, now you're just spouting out communist propaganda. Sorry, I'm just dirty commie. Um, yeah. So uh, I really <clears throat> like this comment because like, it starts more or less reasonable and then the commenter like, kind of went on. Yeah, and this comment goes places. Like, uh, I'm going to read it. Pierre Reynold, I think that's French. Yeah. Pierre uh, Reynold, so, sorry if I'm messing this up. Seven minutes in the video and I start to see some problems here. We blame colonialism on the northern countries, yet we forget the past. What did they do during all this time? Did they innovate? Did they have a social structure that was better than ours? Also, are we blaming northern, northern countries for being stronger and telling weaker countries it's okay to be weak? My point is, if you are weak, don't be surprised that those that worked harder take advantages of their fruits. It would be insane not to do so. It would be like working harder and work and yet not demand a higher wage or to apply for a higher position. Yes, it's unfortunate the poor will always be with us. There will always be someone worse off. But that doesn't mean the strong should remain with the lowest. The law of the strongest isn't a law that we created. It's a universal law. It applies in nature, physics, and other sciences. It applies to planets, animals, humans, and success among many other things. Zig Zig mm. Sorry, that's... Yeah. Um, his grandpa was in Wehrmacht. That's a very, very common thing for leftists here in Poland. Yeah. Yeah, in a way... Uh, we kind of skipped a bit in the middle just to show like, when the kind of the mask dropped. Uh, a lot of this was semi-fascist rhetoric and this one was just one of the more obvious ones. I mean, aside from the guy named Imperium Occidentis or something. Um, but the thing is uh, here, what's the law of the strongest? 
Like, that's not even the law. That's not anything that exists. Um, that, yeah, that's like uh, addressing human nature. It's in human nature to take advantage of the weak. But, uh, but that, that's even more than that. It's like, uh, I don't know, uh, like you have gravity and you have one body attracting the other body and one body has more mass. So it's going to attract the other body to it. And that's saying that, oh, this is like the law of nature and this is why we should do colonialism. So this is like trying to impose not even this stuff on human nature, but trying to impose it on the universe itself. And just like you're making an abstraction to make a point that's kind of bad here. And another point that was very often mentioned was like uh, what you said, the human nature that, oh yeah, it was human nature, just we just did it first. Like, if we didn't do it, then if you look at all the humanity ever, there were always conquerors. And that means just Europe got here first, and if it wouldn't gotten here first, then it would be the colonized one. And it's kind of like saying that, oh yeah, sure, I killed my neighbor and took his stuff, because that's just like human nature. My brother in Christ, this is not human nature. This is your nature that you're trying to say is human. Right. And backing up to the point of uh, actually colonialism, like saying that Europe was stronger because it was just stronger and weaker countries were just weaker, isn't also all that correct? Even before the great conquest of the world began in 1400s, Europe wasn't all that of a powerful continent. Actually, the colonization and the trade with the empires of the time made it a wealthy continent that could afford a bigger expansion into the you know, unknown territories that they first settled a basis in and then just basically stole, like, say, US. Yeah, that was a very um, also interesting argument. Okay, here, here's an example of what we uh, wanted to say. A comment from Wes who said, It is a fallacy to say that colonialism is why Africa is suffering. Singapore used it to be a colony as well. And it's a booming economy. Corruption is why Africa is suffering. It does still mean that greed is at the root. But it's greed from the corruption and not from previous colonialism. Okay, so there are two points here. One is like Singapore, or we had some other examples. Like maybe, maybe you'll say something here, or maybe you just cut out what I'm saying, but maybe I'll find a comment. On the one hand, like... I'm not that good at geography, but I'm pretty sure like the country of Singapore is a bit bigger than the country of Africa. Definitely. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So he backs me up. So, you know, we're both Polish people. So like, yeah, yeah we know everything. Um, I think like the country of Africa also has many different countries in it, but like, don't quote me or maybe just like Europe, you know, like one country as well. So um, that's one thing you can't compare these quote-unquote countries and the other thing um, that was said about like oh look at the US look at Canada look at Australia it's like yeah I'm looking at them and I can see that the skin tone is kind of changed in the meantime like I wonder what happened here I don't know what usually happens in colonialism times when skin tone changes Probably some type of <clears throat> genocide. <clears throat> yeah, but anyway, so this is a huge mystery, like why these white countries, which are now white, um, are faring so well. Okay, so the other point is um, corruption is why Africa is suffering. And here's also a similar comment in this vein. Can you see what's the problem with it? But why is there corruption? Like, the, were these countries as corrupt and as bad from the get-go? Like, do these people think that when the countries were colonialized, like, all the African people were just, like, lying outside their mud huts? Like, oh my god, I'm so hungry. Like, I can barely survive. It's a good thing you've arrived. Like, otherwise we would have died out. No, that didn't happen. And also the reason that there isn't a strong democratic tradition in there is like maybe they didn't have the time to like vote in the strong democratic 
tradition because of how they were governed before and how chaotically the government was changed. Please remember that all of them are like 70 or 80 years old at best. So this is again like attempting to do like a hard reset. Oh, okay, like, yeah, the colonizers left and they left the country like with zero and then the country could build up from whatever, the default state, you know, like a fresh save game or something. Okay. It's not a game of civilization. Uh, nations didn't start from the same point in history at the same time. Basically, what we have here in Europe is a very distant echo of uh, Roman Empire and Greeks before that. And like you can argue Babylonia before that. Yeah, I'm afraid that now we're getting into Poles talking about stuff. Yeah, Poles, Poles talking about like world history. Another argument that people tried to make, I think I touched it upon, that in the end colonialism was net gain for those countries that were colonialized because colonialists introduced modern technology, education. At the cost of enslaving people and killing them with weapons or diseases that they didn't have way of curing back then. And this is a very horrible way of thinking because what wasn't a net benefit? I mean, Black Death was a net benefit because it helped us to end feudalism and enter capitalism. I mean, the First World War was a net benefit because it broke up the empires. The Second World War was a net benefit because we got a lot of technology out of it. And like, can you see where it's going? Like, just because there was a historical event that had some positive consequences, you can't really say that in the end it was a net benefit because the country, the people right now is in a better situation than they were like in 500 years ago. Let's skipping a lot of history, skipping a lot of just technological progress, which could have been introduced without, you know, us Europeans killing other people or us Europeans killing us Europeans and being so shocked about it. Yeah, we can make a progress without war crimes. Yeah, that's my take on this. Yeah, and just saying that there was some progress made when <clears throat> war crimes were there doesn't mean war crimes are okay. Or in the end, it evened out. No, it didn't. Like, let's separate these two, right? I think that's fair enough. Yeah, I think that's that's a good answer to those questions. So we've done colonialism. Okay. Um, we solved colonialism, everybody. Yeah, my ze szwagrem po pijaku to nie takie kolonializmy rozwiązywali. Czekam, aż ktoś otworzy sobie Google Translate, żeby to przetłumaczyć, co ty powiedziałeś właśnie. We can use that for the blooper reel, basically. No, what I said. No, I'm gonna leave that in. Let people enjoy some spice in life. Uh, the translation was that actually this is like common. Um... Well, don't translate for people. Let them have some fun. Let's see how they try to write that down in Google Translate and fail miserably. Actually, I'm surprised oh, oh. that at some videos people translated that weird Cthulhu font that I put in the video, and they actually got it right. But it's not a reference. Yeah, it's in, in Polish though. That was an Easter egg. Is that is that the beginning of Polish hegemony on YouTube? Perhaps. Or perhaps. God, please no. Please don't. No. Perhaps it's the Polish Caribbean axis of degrowth. It's very real estate. So after that bit, uh, since we solved all problems of the world, now we're gonna read some positive comments for change. Me? Yes, okay. Me again? Okay, sure. So Arcantos writes, as someone from Latin America, Brazil, I really hate, by the way, uh, congratulations on recent elections. We, we are really happy for you guys. I really hate the green agenda from the bottom of my heart. Europeans and Americans explored, deforested most of their native forest, used coal and other means of energy to get where they were, left the rest of the world 50 years behind. Now we, here in Latin America, have to take responsibility as a united humanity. Where was the unity when we were exploited? Let's explore our riches as well as chart our new path without interference from the first world. Yeah, this comes as a nice counterpoint to some of these colonialist narratives that, oh yeah, now we should practice unity. And actually, one thing um, I heard some time ago, and it's 
stuck me, stuck with me for a long time. Um, was from an activist friend, like congrats on being a dad. Was from a long time activist friend who said that the spark for the new world is going to come from Latin America. If you look at solar punk and if you look at other stuff, like guys. We ruido the matter in your name. We ruido the matter in your name. That's probably pronounced differently. We are botching this up. Or shorbanie yerby. Yeah, shorbanie yerby sounds Sh- properly for us. Shorbierby. Shorbierby also. Right. So another one coming from a legendary name. Thank you for making this video to offer an alternative viewpoint of Kurzgesagt. I've always held them in high regard, so I was skeptical coming in. I'm in the process of reading both Thinking in Systems and Limits to Growth by Donella Meadows, and something didn't sit right when watching those Kurzgesagt videos. Thanks for putting it into words. Yeah, and Thinking in Systems, yeah, based. Read it. Another one coming from JG Hi-Fi Verse Views. I hope that's right. When dystopia begins to seem more realistic than utopia, you know something has gone horribly wrong. I mean, seriously? We aren't the problem. We are the solution. We are, all of us together, more than capable of doing things the likes of which this world has never seen. Screw dystopia. We can feed and shelter everyone here and all those that are soon to come, providing healthcare, education and, finally, opportunity rather than precarity for the most vulnerable amongst us. Yeah, um, and I really love this. We aren't the problem, we are the solution. Another one coming from Beleza Wood. Everyone watching needs to give this a thumbs up, like, to help it go viral. Sure, it's an hour-long bitter pill, but that's exactly what the world needs to swallow now. And that happened, actually. Thanks, guys. Like, we went viral somehow. I don't know. Absolutely, I did. I have no idea how. It, I was just one day... One evening I was just looking at T3 statistics and I was like, oh, okay. Like, I haven't checked it in two days. Like probably there was a drop or something. So like, let's see what's going on. And suddenly I look at the last 48 hours, which tended to be like, I don't know. Um, I think at that point, the last 38 hour, 48 hours vids went down to something like 1500 views or something, which was like the low end of even our Polish channel. Um, it was, I think, sometime after us publishing the um, Capital Scene video, like a week or so after. And at the best of times, we had like 15,000 views at that point. And then I click and I see it's like 41,000. And there's just this huge spike in the analytics that says nothing, just says browse features. I was just algorithm saying, okay, you know, guys, go ahead. And I think at that time we this video gained like, I don't know, 300,000 views or something within a week or less. So yeah, that was bloody viral. And that's when we wanted to do like a 15K Q&A and we'll have to end up doing a 20K Q&A because yeah, that was awesome. And thanks, thanks Beleza Wood. Like you predicted that. And oh. another one from A, this video is the peak of clickbait. Well, thank you. I did my best with a thumbnail. And yes, yes, yeah, yes, it is. Like I absolutely love the thumbnail. It was as usual. It was like collective work. One of us had the idea, then the other one improved on it, then the other one saw it, and so on and so on. So it went. Yeah, one of those rare cases. And yeah, again, it's got like eight hundred thousand views. So the peak of clickbait is correct. Um, also, if you look really, really closely, you can see that there's actually a Bill Gates in that shadowy figure. Yeah. Uh, what I really loved is that sometimes there are some comments from like excited denialists, like, oh, come on, you tell them how it is. Oh, yeah, great. Go, go. And then you've got like them absolutely seething when they actually watch some part of the video. Like, yeah, it's beautiful to watch also, like at what moments people get triggered. Some get turned off by seven minutes in and another at the end. So, yeah, very interesting. But uh, I really love what Dr. K, like from Healthy Gamer GG, said about clickbait. Based. 
on the internet, you have to trick people into learning. And yeah, that's what happened here. And this is such a high effort clickbait. Come on, it's not like uh, there's like, uh, you know, whatever, Bill Gates or the Kurt Kazakh bird with like a circle around it and an arrow pointing to it and saying, complete destruction, this bird lies. Like, come on, you gotta admit. That's your average clickbait. Is that all? Is that it? Is that all we had of those beautiful comments? Oh, th there's one uh, very important warning. Uh, from small winner Big Dreams, Kurz Gazakt has a heavy left-leaning bias, so they have to be taken with a grain of salt. Do they, though, have left-leaning bias? I mean, thanks for the warning. Do they? Uh, honestly, thanks for the warning, like... Yeah, thanks for the warning, but I didn't want. I was afraid to being exposed to some left-wing propaganda or something. Some God left forbid. But do they though? Oh, there's some stuff with voting with your wallet that we're just gonna leave it, leave it here to be read, because it's nice. I honestly okay. don't know what you're gonna show. Uh, there were some actually cool. From Sata Channel. This is what real ecologists are supposed to be. Science and philosophy must work together. Yeah, and um, I love it because that's how it should be. That's what we're trying to show here. And that's what we saw that there isn't that much on YouTube. Yeah, and the last comment that we're going to read today comes from Surge Land. Uh, okay. so, uh, maybe, sorry, Surge Land? I'm sorry if I'm messing that up. I'm really bad with accents, as you could tell already. I appreciate that you gave us indigenous folks some recognition. Too often this topic is dominated by white liberals who talk down to natives and to those in the global south, like, like Kurzgesagt. Amazing video, looking forward to seeing more. Excellent. Thank you very much. Yeah, um, I guess one point that maybe we can understand the global south a little bit is that uh, while we come from the privileged part of the world, we come from basically just the border between the better and the worse Europe. Like basically after German unification, I know that there's still differentiation in Germany between East and the West, but you have sometimes towns that are cut into Polish and German half, and the difference can be staggering. So like we're the European East. And by the way, like if you're not a Polish person, you're basically not allowed us to call us Eastern Europeans. Like only we have the E word privilege. You have to say we're Central Europeans or else. And it's, it's always amazing when you go abroad and you meet this like nice criticism. Uh, like, I mean, uh, these compliments like, where are you from? Poland. Oh, but you speak English so well. Uh, thanks. Uh, I'm actually, you know, one of the I'm stupid Polish. Like, I'm not sure what you were trying to say here. And yeah, on the other hand, you get the situations like, oh, there's this nice conversation. Where are you from? Poland. Oh, and the conversation's over. Okay, is there anything else that we would like to cover? Um, okay, if you lasted this long in the video, please remember to ask us for the 20k plus Q&A special stuff which is coming sometime, not, not that soon, hopefully, because we'd like to release at least one video in the meantime. Um, our current plan is to get our friend to actually record his part to make the solar punk video. And Again. that's not me, that's another guy. Yeah, just uh, type come on Pavel with all, all caps in the comments. And we'll forward everything and stuff his mailbox probably. But uh, also, um, out of the stuff that uh, people mentioned um, that could be interesting, that could perhaps be translated and maintain more or less the level of uh, T3 and be useful for global YouTube, is our video on five stages of fascism by Robert Paxton. Because that's something that we saw reference very often, uh, but by leftist YouTubers, but no one really kind of like works that out aside from reading the definition. The definition itself is provided at the end of the book, very much precisely so that uh, it doesn't make sense without reading the book beforehand. 
uh, because you have to see it as a process. So that's one thing, but that's not really connected to climate. So we're not sure if and when we're going to do that. Um, there's also one interesting introduction on structuralism, uh, which is like pure philosophy. And it's one of my earlier works, like as an independent, not just referencing something, but something I created. I think that might be interesting as well. But uh, again, it doesn't deal with the climate, but perhaps it helps to understand some things. Going back to the genesis of the channel, thinking deeper mm. on some stuff. So is that all for announcements? I guess so at this point. like We've announced this degrowth video so many times. like The announcements are going to be longer than the video itself. Yep, surely. I feel that already. That whole week of editing this Q&A. Right, so we're going to be closing, right? Yep. So, see you folks again next time. And remember, e confederacja. That was old Polish greeting for goodbyes. Don't worry. Uh, so, that's all for now. We'll see you again next time. And see ya. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. Uh, e confederacja. Bye. Bye. Yeah, uh, you might want to adjust your microphone. I think you're talking next to it instead of into it. Oh, I thought that was the point. Yeah, but uh, not, not not like into the microphone. He, he might be uh, Wait. like turned differently towards you, but you have to aim your mouth towards the microphone. Oh, 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 oh. Ooh. Ooh, yeah, ooh, uh, uh. Okay, check. Why? 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 Uh, oh. it's, it got unscrewed up in here. Technical difficulties. So, like this. Yeah, but when you're talking, uh, I would advise having it like more like this. Okay. Okay. So, <laughs> supposed to sit like this or something? If you might push it away but yeah but the point being is that you want to talk into the microphone when you're talking like to me talk through the microphone when okay you're, when you're uh, like looking at the screen talk, talk uh, through the microphone to look at the screen yeah and this it's, is it's it's kind of you know gymnastics but you'll get used to it yeah and this is exactly like why there are two of us like Panan at some point got very much into microphones and recording and stuff and today he came to my house like we set up all this stuff and he goes like oh no this is doing some handling noise and this is doing some whatever other slang he said and I'm just like left here guessing uh, and by the way yeah, yeah I know this is like probably going to go to the blooper bit and you're wondering haha why are you talking in English? We're talking in English because like, we don't want to switch constantly back and forth. Because that's probably going to make yeah, our English me worse. Messing up the flow. Okay, just making sure that the recording is fine. Like, I'm not going into oranges at any point. Okay, like, okay. That's good. Yeah, uh, like, yellows are good, red is bad. Like, red is bad. Yellow is good. Still. Yeah, like, like, like so. Oh, we are already... Okay, we are rolling. We are rolling. You've probably heard my... So this is more or less what this stuff is... I'm leaving that one in. So ne next question that often popped up was... Uh, how can we be... What? Hold on. Sorry. Damn. Sorry. Uh, that was Yerba Sounds. Uh, it, it's... The ba, the, the ba. But that's a topic for another topic. Awesome. Uh, so anyway, yeah, but this is... We're going to have a guest host and probably then we'll have some... What the f*** is a guest host? <laughs> Degrowth has to challenge the idea that glow... Growth? Glow. And I'm gonna play the Metal Gear Solid theme here. I'm nuclear! I don't know what lyrics are. I haven't heard the song really in like a few years. You know, the people who reject social scientists. Scientists. Like the people who reject social scientists. 
censuses. Censuses. Okay, so whoa. Is yeah, this much it's crossing? it's. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. This is this is great. Yeah, excellent. That was a mic test, by the way. We are testing our we are testing our mics in a uh, not really the mainstream way. We are just uh, yelling at it. Of the nuclear bad, good nuclear bad. The, the thingy. Okay, I, I guess I'm. We we can take another break now. Those locals were not uh, making land uh, subservient to them, so apparently they weren't worthy of that land, and that land was up for grabs, said Europeans arriving at America. So they did. It's free real estate. Okay, but... Fuck, <coughs> oh, that's hot. Ah. Well, you have some Brazilian... Trying to work, work out where is this mate from? Yep, yeah, it's Brazilian. So cheers to Brazilian yerba. What, a, what type of is? It's rubbish. <laughs> but we don't have to say that. Yeah, okay. It's a green mate, and actually, Marisha gave it to me because she tried to drink mate and she decided it sucks. And it totally sucks. Like, ah, it's horrible. But uh, on the other hand, like, verde mate is also Brazilian. Oh, mate. So, what verde mate is good. Yeah, it's verde mate pretty, is pretty, pretty good. Awesome. Like, recently, I, I know that no one cares, but recently there's been a huge... Uh, I mean, some time ago there was a huge explosion in Poland packaged mate from Brazil, mostly. I think now uh, Paraguayan mate is also becoming slowly popular. Um, and actually one of our favorite brands, which is called verde mate, is yeah Brazilian with some flavors added and the flavors are pretty damn good yeah we are still uh, no i actually had one i had canarias a canarias is from it's brazilian, brazilian as well Canari canarias with herbs herbs sorry okay but still let's not forget argentina um, let's not forget argentine 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 argentinian ah, thank you let's not forget argentinian mate which is like um yeah, and we also had like one of Poles. He have gone to Peru and. But that's Amanda. That's Amanda. Right. Okay, like, so okay, we have, we're like, gonna cut this or we're gonna place it somewhere else in the way. This is like. Okay. I'm gonna take my time. <laughs> <laughs> 